Hi everybody, welcome to Talking Automotive with Mark and John. My name is John Sinclair and my co-host Mark Palavestra. Hi John, and uh, just have to acknowledge the the black eye that you've got there is not from an argument that you and I had, but it was a training mishap that you had, is that correct? Yeah, unfortunately Mark, uh, I went for a run this morning and fell over and hit my head on the pavement, so <laughs> it's unfortunate circumstances. I think starting to get old age tripping over my own feet. As long as the wisdom hasn't been impacted. Today's episode, we had Ben talk about the processing. Every car is important, so every car has to be processed. So next week, we're going to have uh, Christoph de Perna, who will outline how the regions expect the Australian markets to operate and all those machinations of exchange rate, supply chain, product development, and all those bits and pieces that come into play to end up being cars sold through dealers. So it's a fascinating exercise that is undertaken with the uh, Asia Pacific region. Yeah, Mark, this is going to be a really great topic because it's often a big challenge is trying to manage the local conditions, but then also meet all the requirements of your global head office and through either Asia Pacific office or Middle East office. And so it's all the reporting requirements and keeping them up to date on exactly what's happening and getting them to understand the local market. And then what you also have is once you get someone to understand the market, people turn over and you get a new boss and you have to start from the beginning again, teaching them about the Australian market. So really interesting. And I think it's going to be a fascinating podcast. Today, we've got a great speaker. We've got Ben Lazary. Ben is the GM of business partnerships at Precar Services. And we cover off uh, what a lot of people forget or aren't aware of the actual complexity that is undertaken in dealing with uh, processing vehicles as they arrive and get processed and get stored or transported to the dealerships. So there's a lot that happens that most people aren't aware of and Ben does a great job in covering all those aspects of PDIs, the services they provide, the challenges that they have to overcome and the solutions that they provide for dealers, fleet customers and uh, OEMs. Yeah, Mark, and I think he also identifies a couple of opportunities which uh, any OEM should focus on to try and reduce their costs for that whole PDR process. A really good show, really worth listening to. So let's jump into it. On today's podcast, we have a very, very knowledgeable guest, uh, one with an extensive experience in sales, after sales, uh, marketing and product as well. He's a car guy. Uh, 20 years at General Motors and two years now at Precar Services. Welcome, Ben Lazary. Hi, Mark. Great to join you and uh, looking forward to having a chat. Yeah, good to have you on the show, Ben. Great. Thanks, John. Nice to meet you as well. Ben, starting off, maybe you can just give us a bit of background to who is Precar, how long you've been in business, and sure. just share with the listeners you know, a, bit about, a little bit about yep. yourselves. Yeah, thanks, John. So um, Precars are what we call a, a shore-to-door finished vehicle logistics business um, led by our CEO, Alex Milan. Um, we celebrated our 30th anniversary in 2018, uh, but the business has history and roots going back to the early 1970s in Western Australia as a primarily a transport business. But through the 1970s and beyond, the vehicle business evolved and Precar was uh, first and foremost a vehicle processing organisation. Um, in 2012, Precar acquired Toll Auto Logistics and became that fully-fledged finished vehicle logistics company, as I say, that, that shore-to-door um, operation. We've got about a 1,000 employees uh, around the countryside. Um, we have, from a senior leadership team, more than 200 years' experience either within the OEM car industry space or the vehicle logistics area. Um, and we're supported by some fantastic shareholders. So we're 50% owned by Toll and we're the other 50% owned by K-Line slash Cube. So we've got a, a very proactive, uh, very supportive shareholders and to put that in some perspective for you, John, over the last five years, they have invested $70 million into the pre-car business um, to support us in terms of our fleet and our infrastructure to support our, our customers. And we can talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Um, we're very proud of the fact that our 1,000 employees support around 30 to 35% of the new vehicle um, OEM business in Australia. 
Uh, and that's quite a breadth of customers from some of the smaller emerging brands up to some very well-established and premium marks in the vehicle market. And one thing that that drives the whole pre-car team is a need to be nimble and flexible because all of our customers do something quite different. Um, and whilst we've got a, an underpinning of that basic finished vehicle logistics business operation, we are increasingly looking to the future because uh, we know that the automotive market is changing and we understand how people want to buy and own vehicles is changing, not to mention the plethora of alternate propulsion technology coming around the electric and autonomous space uh, and some of the requirements that we'll touch on a little bit later on in terms of how we can support some fleet customers um, and more bespoke vehicle requirements to give our customers that true end-to-end -end vehicle logistics offering. Now, Ben, that's, um, that's fascinating that pre-car's been around that long. I must admit, I, I, I've seen the, uh, the recent iteration, but you know, 30 years, that's pretty significant. Now, I'm keen to get an understanding for our listeners because some people will know extensively how a PDI works, which is your organisation, yeah. but very much almost like suck eggs type question is, how does a VPC work, which is a vehicle processing centre? How does yeah. that work? Yeah. And what services do you actually do? Since we've gone away from local manufacturing, all cars are imported. So yeah. what we're keen to uh, yeah. get an understanding is that what do you actually do in sure. the VPC? Love to talk you through that, Mark, and, and you're spot on. And, and, you know, people see our pre-car trucks and possibly just think that we're just a transport company, but that that's not true. So... Um, the whole vehicle processing centre starts and that journey of that vehicle starts when the vehicles come off the ship at the wharf. And we pick them up and we bring them into one of our compounds. And just as an introductory comment, every time you see a pre-car uh, truck carrying vehicles around the countryside and any other logistic services provider um, in Australia, every single vehicle on that truck has had some form of touch point from a vehicle processing centre to get it ready for delivery out to that final customer. And the breadth of services that we offer can be uh, something as simple as putting an owner's handbook and floor mats into the vehicle or fitting the vehicle up from a, a bespoke fleet vehicle requirement. So to support that vehicle processing centre, we've got a, a national coverage mark. We've got uh, VPCs in all the main cities. We've got two in New South Wales. We've got three in Victoria. Um, we have three in Queensland, which includes one in um, Townsville in North Queensland. Uh, we have one in Perth and we have one in Adelaide and a small one in Darwin. Uh, we service Tasmania out of Victoria. Some of the key uh, services that we offer through um, our VPC uh, that I'll touch on now, on-wolf processing. So we know we live in what I call a demand economy. Everyone wants their vehicle now, they need it delivered now, or they need their new fridge delivered now. We offer a service called on-wolf processing. Uh, and that basically allows us three days out from a ship arriving into port, the car company will advise us all the vehicles that are sold on that boat and sold out to a retail customer. And we process and build those vehicles on our VPC at the wharf. So instead of having to take the vehicle off the boat um, and bring it into an inland facility, those customer sold cars get built on the wharf and straight out to the customer or straight out to the dealership. So that gives a measurable benefit in processing time and make sure we're getting those customer sold cars out as quickly as possible. The balance of the vehicles come into our, our main compounds um, where we undertake a range of activities in the vehicle processing centre. In my introductory comments, I touched on the fact that we've got quite a number of customers and they all do something different. Um, and that can't be more, more truthful than when we look at how we process vehicles and how we bring them into our compound. Some customers, their cars come in bond paid, some come in under bond. Some come in in terms of being fully built up, some come in and we need to add further build to those vehicles as they come into the compound. And to give you an example, a number of our larger customers utilise a service that we call pre-build. So the vehicles come off the wharf, they're not sold to a customer, so they come inland to one of our compounds and we pre-build them. So we might put in those floor mats, we might put in those uh, the owner's handbook, we might fit a, a multimedia unit to some vehicles so the vehicle is ostensibly built up. Then when it's allocated to a dealer for a wholesale or a customer has signed an order for that vehicle, we then go and do a, a number of smaller services, compliance plate the vehicle, we might give it a wash and then we send it out. The benefit of that pre-build model is that we have the vehicles ready to go pretty well from the get-go. We can plan the supply of parts into our compound with our customers to make sure we've got the right part in the right place at the right time to allow that vehicle, once it's allocated, to basically just get a quick wash, a quick check, compliance, and out it goes. Other customers build um, on allocation, and that may mean we're sitting, might be sitting in one of our compounds, bond paid, 
but a dealer will take that vehicle for a wholesale it will be allocated to that dealer and then we'll do all that build in one go we won't do the pre-build so all the formats and the multimedia and the um, owner's handbook and the compliance plate are all done in the one go others do things as i say when they release from bond we also offer pre-delivery and registration services in our, in our inland compound activity um, where we actually prepare for company vehicles and register them for delivery out to our OEM customers. And then we go out and we pick up the defleeted cars and, and we bring them back. We offer a company vehicle handover process in our compounds where employees from car companies can come out with their old company car, drop that off, pick up a new one and off they go. In terms of our inland compounds as well, we have a, a national parts uh, operation where we support that parts supply for all our customers um, and offer inventory management for a broad range of parts, be it from small things like a sticker right up to large things like um, sports bars and, and bull bars and so on. Through the VPCs around the country, we also offer a range of storage services. Um, we have large storage compounds nationally that are either in the open or we have hail mesh uh, facilities available. Uh, we can store north of about 60,000 vehicles on a national basis and we make sure that those vehicles are parked off in accordance with the customer requirements. So um, you'd be amazed at the amount of detail, everyone, in terms of how our customers demand or prescribe that vehicles are parked, where they're parked, the distance between them, whether the handbrake is on or off, whether the vehicle's in park or neutral, uh, if the mirrors are full, for example. So we offer that and all those grid locations are tracked through our IT systems. And we store vehicles from small passenger cars right through to large prime movers. Uh, and more recently, some of the high and heavy equipment, including, including forklifts. Um, and obviously the bulk of our storage is for our OEM new vehicle customers, but we offer dealer storage uh, solutions. So individual dealers can store their cars in the pre-car compound. Um, we offer used vehicle storage for some remarketing organisations. And we have interstate transit hubs um, up the eastern seaboard where vehicles that are moving between states uh, are stored in our interstate transit hub as they progress through that vehicle transport cycle. For the vehicles that remain in our compound and, and may not be allocated or sold to a dealer or wholesale to a dealer at this point in time, we also preserve those vehicles. So it's one thing just to store them, but they get a bit dusty and dirty. And if they're sitting around for any period of time, the batteries can obviously go flat and, and we can uh, we, we don't want you know flat spot on the tyres and things like that. So. We have vehicle preservation teams who, in accordance with, again, our customer requirements, go out and check the battery and, and check the tyres and rotate the tyres. They might take the car for a quick drop around the compound just to make sure there's no corrosion building up on brake discs. They might start the car to make sure the battery's okay. They'll check the tyres, they'll charge the battery if need be, and in some cases they'll do some more detailed underbody checks and so on. Uh, we have a number of washing facilities as well, touchless washing facilities that are part of our preservation program. Uh, and we do that for all of our customers in some form or the other. And one of the key points here that in, you know, we talk about an eye on the future is you know, we preserve traditional combustion, internal combustion engine vehicles, but we also offer preservation services on some of the um, alternate propulsion vehicles that are coming through. So your hybrids and your electrics as well. And we know that's obviously going to grow and grow. One of our main sites at uh, Kembley Grange in New South Wales actually has quite a, a detailed electric vehicle preservation area where there's a number of charges that are installed, all to customer requirements, and they support uh, the preservation of those specific vehicles. Uh, and rounding out, the, the vehicle process centre is our what we call rectification services. So unfortunately, with cars coming in from all parts of the world now, well, not often, but from time, a car will come in, it might need a touch-up, it might have a small dent, it might need a little bit of paint rectification. Uh, and we offer all those services internally. And in New South Wales and Victoria, we actually have a fully commissioned paint booths that can offer a, a very detailed range of paint and rectification services. So that, in a snapshot, Mark, um, that's our vehicle processing centre. So a lot more to it than just getting the car off the wharf and onto a pre-car truck out to a dealer. Uh, and we've got a, a hundreds of people who support that vehicle processing activity around the country. Each of our states has a state vehicle processing manager overseeing uh, these activities. One of the, I think the unique or niche um, benefits of pre-car is that we've got that breadth of customers and we do need to be dimble, but 
we further support all of our activities with the National Technical Department. And that National Technical Department are tasked with ensuring that all the requirements, all the processes, all the technical details that we are furnished with from our customers are input into our system so that when our team's on the floor need to go and build a car, preserve a car, fix a car, we know exactly what the customer requires, how long it needs to be done, any parts that need to be uh, you know, procured to make that happen uh, so that we can make sure we're giving them that, that very high level of technical service for their, their vehicles. Wow, it's it's a fair bit when you when you actually summarise it like that, Ben. I, I, like I've been dealing with different PDIs for for quite a few years, as you have, and now you're you're, you're in one. That's actually a very diverse and complex mm. uh, number of services that you provide. Given that we've gone away from local manufacturing, every car now is fully imported, and just the variations that you get from brand to brand. Do you find that there's a standardised process that most brands need or is it does it vary significantly from say one to another there's a general core of activities obviously about getting the vehicle complied and making sure it's ready to go out to market um, and as you'd appreciate mark there's a number of things that have to be in the vehicle to make sure it is compliant from an adr perspective so that part of it's quite consistent but as you'd appreciate with different cars coming from different parts of the world in different you know different models different specifications of vehicles there's a a plethora of information that goes into making sure we understand the vehicles correctly and understand what the customers need. So um, no two days are typically the same here, and that's a good thing because it keeps us all quite busy. Uh, and we're really proud of the fact that we've got very close relationships with our with our customers so that we can be constantly in touch with these guys who are my account managers to, to make sure that any changes or any modifications they need to make, we can factor in quickly. And they do get factored in quickly. We do have customers who are always wanting to move more metal who are asking us to process and build and preserve more vehicles than they might have at the start of any one month. So we keep ourselves busy and, and we've got to make sure that we, we tick all the boxes and, and you know, dot the I's and cross the T's. Our VPC staff have a buddy system to make sure that we've got a checkoff process. Our customers are always welcome on site to ensure that if they wish to do an audit in our process that, that we can support that. And we have a national quality division that, that oversee all that uh, activity as well to make sure that we are compliant right through the processing journey of the vehicle. Because it'd be fair to say you're a significant piece in that CSI uh, survey result that a new car delivery has because the vehicle has to be shipped in, so there's the whole supply chain logistics, but you're the critical piece that maintains that quality and often repairs the quality before it goes out. Correct. Yeah, I mean, that's right. Pretty uh, diverse uh, and fairly serious bit of responsibility that uh, rests on the organisation shoulders and the, the teams that you have working for you. 100%, Mark. You know, obviously, um, once the vehicle comes into the wharf, our friends in the car companies don't see the vehicle until it goes to a dealer. So it's, we take that responsibility very seriously. And uh, that's why we've got that focus from a, an audit and quality and technical perspective to make sure we support it right along its journey out to the dealership. Ben, a, a word for me which is quite scary is always that preservation because it means we haven't, as an automotive guy, sold the car quick enough. Correct. Are there certain timelines that it clicks over and then you automatically do a preservation process or do you wait for the brand to come back to you and, and say, can you preserve these cars? Yeah. The, the customers will give us a timetable, John, so it might be every seven days you do this, every 14 days you do that, every month you do this. If it's still there within 60 days, you need to do this. If it's still there within 90 days, you need to do this. So we operate exclusively on the direction and requirement of the customer. Having said that, if we pick up anything through the course of our preservation activities that might not be covered in their requirements or their SOP, as we call them, we feed that back to them. It's all triggered by the customer requirements. And you're right. I mean... Preservation is not something that car companies want to be dealing with too much because they want the cars to come in and out effectively and be wholesaled out to dealers. Yeah, another question for me, Ben, you have a lot of these cars brought in by ship. They all get shipped in and that. Do you see any trends in terms of damage? And does it change over time or is it particular parts of the year you get more damage or less damage? We are. Obviously, we're seeing that sustained shift away from you know traditional passenger cars to, to vehicles like SUVs and utes, John, and um, a lot of them are, are larger vehicles just by nature of, of the way the market's gone. By and large, the damages are, I mean, they happen, but we don't see any systemic trends or, or 
or major issues from a damages perspective because there's a lot of work done before the vehicles are loaded at their point of departure in terms of assessment by customers and they've got quite stringent guidelines with their shipping lines as to how the vehicles need to be loaded and, and secured down onto the into the ship. And then when the vehicles come off, before we do anything with the vehicle, we have a, um, a first point of survey or first point of rest survey on the walls where any, any issue is highlighted there and then. And typically at that point in time, John, uh, a vehicle, if it's damaged, will be normally, well, really only one of two things. It might be a manufacturing defect, in which case the car company will push that through their warranty division, or it's an insurance or transit damage claim from when the vehicle has been on the boat, you know, the vehicle came un unhitched or something through the process of shipping. Once we take possession of that vehicle and that survey is signed off and we've got that all documented, we then bring the vehicle into our compound and we do another survey on receding to our compound, so a second rest point survey. To answer your question, we're not seeing any systemic issues in terms of transit damage or overall damage. We are we work very closely with our customers to make sure that we're very careful, for example, around front bumper scrapes, alloy wheel scrapes. The alloy wheels are getting bigger and, and, and softer um, and are prone to, to damage. So uh, we're very careful. We have guidelines around that. Our national fleet manager, who's a real car guy too, Mark, I might add, spends a lot of his time working with our customers doing load trials. So when a new vehicle is released, we actually get one of their pilot vehicles out here and we do a load trial onto our trailer to make sure that we can load it safely and not scrape rings or scrape front bumpers or knock doors into the trailers. So in my time here, certainly damages are, I don't see them anywhere near as prevalent as, I'll be honest, as I did when I was at Holden when we had a little bit more vehicle damage uh, going back a few years. I think there's been a lot of work done by the OEMs through the FCAI with finished vehicle logistics providers to, to understand we have to mitigate damages wherever we can. And a number of our customers put plastic covers on their on their wheels, for example, to stop alloy wheel scrapes, um, tapes and things like that to stop bumper scrapes. Uh, and part of the, you know, I touched on before about some of the prescriptive guidelines that our customers give us around parking vehicles is all, all designed to mitigate damage or, or scrapes and scratches when you're in our compound or or going onto our trucks. It's it's interesting, Ben, that, that, that damage uh, scenario, I must admit, in, in a previous life, your organisation helped us identify issues in the damage supply chain because we're yes. getting a high incidence of arrivals into the country yes. with damage. And it was through working with you guys that we, uh, that you actually directed to us that, hey, there's going to be a potential problem because all these particular vehicles were being transshipped in some way, shape or form, either through North Africa or somewhere else. Uh, and the, the outcome was that right-hand drive cars in low volume being driven by people who predominantly drive left-hand drive cars in confined spaces usually meant that there was damage to the left-hand side of the vehicle and left-hand wheels were scraping. Uh, and it was only through that reverse uh, engineering, if you like, of, well, okay, if, they, if you guys surveyed them, this is what you were seeing, we used right. data to measure it and say, right, okay, where are the issues? Work back with the supply chain, logistics, uh, the shipping organisations and spoke with data and basically identified that these guys are either damaging it at the uh, when they transship them because uh, they're offering left-hand drives normally and there's a handful of right-hand drives coming to Australia and uh, they cause the damage. So uh, it's really good to uh, speak with data and, and good that you guys from downstream uh, have changed your uh, your rolling stock to uh, minimise the damage to the dealers. Yeah, so Mark, you, your example was a, a very pertinent one and um, my account managers probably get sick of me saying this, but we need to add value at every step along the way to our our customers. It's easy for us just to go and pick up and, and deliver vehicles and, and process them, but we understand that we're being entrusted with you know hundreds and millions of dollars worth of asset here and, and people are spending a lot of money on their new vehicles. So we need to be feeding back information that we we glean from our operations to our customers to ensure that that quality can be the best it can be. There's a couple of other customers where we've been able to do similar sort of activity where that, that feedback has gone straight back, in some cases overseas. Um, it might not drive a production change, but it might drive a, a preparation change or a preparation change at some point along the supply chain. So um, it's easy for us just to pick cars up and deliver them, but we need to make sure that's been done and they're in the, the best possible condition they can be. Now, it's, vehicle condition's a big one. Uh, now, you've talked about you've got this supply of vehicles coming in, like normally boats arrive every month and yep. through the month. You've got car carriers coming in nonstop, stevedores unloading, way you go, either wharf processing or mm -hmm. 
transport into a compound and then off to uh, dealerships. We know every year there are curveballs and we are a very protective country from a quarantine perspective. COVID even shows that we are pretty good at it as well. But uh, we know that there are things called stink bugs and other seed contamination, et cetera, that come along. Just for our listeners, uh, it'd be good it'd be good to get an understanding of what quarantine issues you have to deal with and, and the sure. curveballs that you come with. Sure. So they're many and varied. Uh, and as I mentioned before, with, with the breadth of vehicles that are coming from all around the world now, it's not just Japan and Germany, for example. We've got cars coming in from Korea, from China, from Eastern Europe, from America, Mexico, you name it pretty well now, apart from locally made cars. We do get a number of seasonal Contaminants, shall I say, that we need to, to manage and we need to deal with. Um, we need to have a relationship with the quarantine department and those rules, Mark, as you say, are very vigorous and in some instances we don't have a lot of control over what we can and can't do. We are directed to either stop or, or do something by quarantine in conjunction with, with our customers. So we see the, the stink bug activity. We see seed contamination um, pollen contamination. We've had examples where a batch of vehicles have come out of a production plant with fallout on them from overseas, and we've had to work with a, our customer to, to rectify some of those vehicles. Um, we've had situations, obviously, locally where we can have a hailstorm, for example. We need to manage that. So um, we, we have a number of ways of doing that. Obviously, we have contractual uh, obligations that we need to, to fill through. We need to make sure that our quality and audit teams are working with quarantine. But first and foremost, we need to work with our customers and we, we formulate plans to work through those. They can be challenging because invariably, as I'm sure you will all appreciate, these things often happen towards the later part of the month and every vehicle needs to get out and we need to formulate plans to, to get vehicles into our compound and build them as quickly as we can. But uh, part, of, part of what we do is, is managing the unknown and uh, that, that's increasingly becoming part of the business and we just need to make sure we've got the best people on the ground to work with our customers to do that, Mark, but we, we know that some are seasonal. The stink bug season is it's pretty well the same time every year. And to touch on the point before, I know that a couple of our customers have used our example of stink bugs and some other contaminants here and have had discussions back with their source plants about what they might be able to do to, to try and mitigate the, the delay or the risk or um, contamination of those vehicles. It's a hard thing to do, but again, we are seeing some of those discussions going back the other way. And it's all under the auspice of making sure that they can get cars out as quickly as we can um, on their arrival. But these things are set to test us. You know, I'd use June as an example. Talk about a curveball. The June market went crazy at 110,000 units and no one saw that coming for a period of time. And, and there was curveball after curveball coming at us. We had to look at how we can deliver double the amount of interstate vehicles through the month. We had to do that while well, we had some older vehicles that we had to prepare for customers that needed some further preservation. So we've got the capability. We've with all to do it, we've just got to make sure that we, uh, uh, you know, catch the curveballs and run with them as best we can. Ben, one curveball we had, I think, I think you're well aware of that, is we were with a previous brand. We were bringing in a whole bunch of electric vehicles, mm -hmm. and there was a diesel spill in the ship. Yes, and I think we had to write most of those vehicles off. So and I think you, had, yes. you were yeah, very much involved trying to get those all sorted out. So. That was a doozy, John, uh, and, you know, we again, we had customers on site, we'd have insurers coming on site, we'd have cleaning specialists come on site. It, it, we do what we need to do to see whether we can get the cars out, you know, in a saleable condition, and um, there's there's massive risk done to the, the car company or to the OEM. So, yeah, we don't need to see another one of those. That was a disaster. Yeah, no, it was terrible. So, <laughs> I think for all parties involved, you know, so... So there always seems to be something, Ben, would it be fair to say, because you've got stink bugs, you've got yeah. seed contamination, you've got a diesel spill, as John said, and then that's just on the boats getting here. Yeah. Then when you're actually in the compounds, then you've got storms. So you've got yep. Queensland always has a storm November, right. December. Uh, New South Wales has a storm January, Feb, and then it rolls down to, to Victoria. I think the only yep. one's pretty safe is uh, uh, South Australia and West Australia. They'd be fairly good compounds. That's good. Yeah. Not yeah. terribly nasty, but the golf ball size uh, hailstones seem to love Queensland and Sydney. They do, Mark. Um, and not surprisingly, a number of our customers pay that little bit extra for mesh uh, under storage in, in those states to protect their vehicles. Um, 
because obviously uh, hail is not something that we can control. It's a bit of an act of God. So we a number of them avail themselves of that. We had a dust storm here earlier this year in, in Melbourne, as, as, as you might remember, and, and we had cars covered in dust. So that means that most customers will want the vehicle washed. So that might sound easy enough, but when you've got 14 or 15,000 cars in one compound that might need a wash, that takes a considerable period of time. And um, there's not a lot of understanding from the customer that, hey, we need a bit longer to wash your car. It's, no, no, we need, to, we need that car now. So we have to manage resourcing and planning and overtime and, you know, shifts and all that sort of stuff to, to make all that happen. So, But that's what the car industry does for all of us, isn't it? That's why we love it. There's always something different going on. Indeed. It's, there's never a dull moment in this business. Never. There's always a curveball and there's always something new, which is why uh, I always said beat selling washing machines. But anyway. <laughs> ben, ben, in terms of getting the vehicles out to dealers, can you talk a bit about the challenges you have with getting vehicles across to dealers? Yeah, um, that's a it's a pretty good point, John, and, and perhaps a, a pertinent one at this point in time. Look, we've got a significant transport network. We, we operate, obviously, from Burnie to Broome, as Alex and I like to say. We'll deliver anything anywhere, and we've got a, a couple of transport streams. So our main transport stream is the delivery of OEM vehicles out to dealers. Uh, we also have a retail transport division, but I'll, I'll touch on that momentarily. With the, the biggest challenge that we've had and continue to have, um, with the cessation of local vehicle manufacture, we don't have that certainty around um, what we call a line-off plan, where we know that cars are coming offline at prescribed dates from the one compound all the time. So there was that consistency of planning there. So to put that in real-world example, we knew that we were pulling four or 500 cars a day out of Adelaide. So we knew that we could plan for the, a number of our fleet vehicles to be on that leg between uh, Adelaide and Melbourne, and then that onward leg from Melbourne to Sydney. We don't have that certainty anymore. And we don't have a lot of visibility at an early enough stage in terms of deploying the fleet to know where to put those trucks because with all the vehicles now being imported and most of our customers being either what we call a four-port or a five-port caller, so um, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, or Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, and a couple even going to Darwin, cars are forecast and, and delivered by the OEMs into all parts of the country. And what we're now finding without that certainty and, and we're not seeing the allocation of the vehicle until a point that the vehicle is either in the compound or on a boat at a point where it can't be changed from a port perspective. So we get that information quite late and we might have 200 vehicles in Adelaide that need to come to Melbourne, but we haven't got trucks just sitting around in Adelaide waiting for that vehicle to be available to move across. So from a, a central planning perspective, that variability in vehicle distribution and allocation is, is singly the biggest challenge that we have now. And that's exacerbated um, since we've had the cessation of, of the local vehicle production. Having said that, we work with our customers in terms of comprehending forecast requirements, understanding their wholesale requirements, uh, and we're increasingly getting better feedback from our customers around which vehicles are going into which ports so that we can plan that um, more appropriately and get better visibility on it at an earlier point in time so we can have, have the fleet more appropriately deployed. But that is singly the largest challenge, John, that we have at this point in time. Even with 121 new trailers, um, a brand new fleet of uh, prime movers, um, we've got through our shareholders, we've got toll shipping, so we, we ship vehicles into Tasmania and we've got rail uh, capability across to Western Australia as well. Until we get that vehicle allocated and we know that it's got to go from Melbourne to Brisbane or Perth to Adelaide or whatever the case may be, we're really guessing at where we need the fleet to be. So that, that, that's a, a massive challenge, just that tyranny of distance and the variability of that allocation message. So, Ben, would it be fair to say, so you're having to deal with, say, vehicles that were ordered in as, say, pool stock, Yep. but then they don't necessarily go to the dealers in the compound that they were ordered to go to. That, that can happen quite often, Mark, yeah. So the most efficient operation is if it's inventory is allocated to, ordered and allocated to a dealer, which then goes to that port of entry, Correct. and then it's a local leg as Correct. opposed to an interstate leg because Correct. there's Correct. a red one in Sydney that wants to be sent to Melbourne, and yet there's a blue one in Melbourne that needs to go to Sydney. Correct, Correct. And the, the guy in Melbourne won't buy the blue one, he wants the red one. So it's, you know, um, 
yeah, the ho- obviously the higher the, the allocation rate or the coding rate, the better. And, and a lot of our, I guess, one of the um, silver linings from the current COVID situation is that with production orders currently low and arrivals quite low, as they start to ramp up, a lot of our customers are telling us that dealers are ready to order more vehicles so that they know from the time the vehicle was ordered on the production plant where it needs to go. So you're seeing vehicles coming into the to the local port, if you will. So to your point, it's a local move into the dealership when it arrives. So, you know, the guy in Brisbane ordered 20 cars and they'll come into Brisbane. So that, that that's one, I guess, silver lining from where we are now. Earlier this year when we had a lot more storage, um, cars were going all over the place. And that, that does create some challenge. And do you notice, is there a trend with the larger OEMs or the smaller OEMs? Who, who tends to have more cross-border as a percentage? Is it the large volume guys or is it... It varies, the, Mark. To be yeah, it, look, it varies. You know, the bigger guys, they'll move cars around where they need to to get, to get sales and wholesale. Um, having said that, some of them are starting to impose uh, cross-border charges. Like, if you're familiar, we used to have some of that stuff to try and get dealers focusing on their home port or maybe one border. Uh, but look, it considerably. There's no, there's one customer that has very high allocation rates and the cars come into the right port. But for the rest of them, it's, we, we benchmark a premium or optimum sort of interstate movement is 10% of your total volume. If you're doing under 10% interstate moves, well, you're doing something purely fantastic. Um, 10 to 15% is very good. There's probably a majority of customers are in that 15 to 20, maybe 25% of vehicles are moved interstate. Um, so there's there's no real rhyme or reason to it, but some do it better than others. One does it very well. And just another question for me around transport. So we've seen this change from you know, back in the day, there were lots of Commodores being built, lots of small cars being sold. With this move to... SUVs and medium pickups. So like medium pickups are the, the best selling vehicles, realistically. Oh, yeah, you look at the you know, Hilux, you look at Ranger, uh, Navara, and, uh, and Triton. So you look at, and even Amarok. So these vehicles are a lot bigger uh, when you think of truck and trailers, et cetera. Did you guys have to change anything because of the changes in consumer preferences for products? Look, I, I wouldn't say we're forced to make a change, Mark. It, it, um, the previous uh, fleet of trailers were designed to your point for Commodores and Falcons and they served the industry well for many years and whilst you can still put a Navara or an X-Class or whatever the case may be on a on one of those old trailers, you can't get the capacity and you can't get the efficiency. So part of the investment that the shareholders factored into pre-car was understanding that the market's changing and understanding that we need to service a different type of vehicle um, and that, that drove a strategic plan to replace the fleet with our new um, NCC trailers, which can carry more large SUVs and more utes or you know, medium pickups to better serve the market. And along with that, obviously, come further benefits in terms of efficiency, safety of operation, uh, reductions in repair and maintenance spending. And when you combine that with a new fleet of prime movers, more reliability in the prime mover, a safer, more efficient operating environment for our drivers. And importantly, uh, with an eye on, you know, greenhouse and, and carbon emissions as well. So um, we could have pressed on with the, with the previous fleet. We wouldn't have been able to offer the capacity and efficiency that we have now. And it was the right thing to do to invest the money in the new fleet. I mean, Qantas changed planes over regularly to keep passenger requirements under control. We, it's a similar sort of thinking in terms of what we've done with our fleet. We're very proud of the new fleet. The trailers were designed here and built overseas, but... Uh, you do away with cables along the side. Um, the driver or the operator stands on the ground with remote control and can flick and adjust the decks to get seven large vehicles on a trailer. We've got a cassette that folds across the cabin. And it, it all bubbles up to the professional look and approach of pre-car when a nice shiny new truck and trailer arrives um, at a dealership. It looks pretty special and I think our customers appreciate it. So, it, it, as I say, it wasn't a forced decision. It was a strategic decision and the right decision to make. And it will stand us in good stead for the, the, the foreseeable future with the, the newest, youngest fleet on the road. I must admit, I always uh, admired the guys that would drive cars onto those ramps up the top and over the top of the cabin. <laughs> Back I when I was a, a very young, uh, inex- well, inexperienced, yeah, yeah, young technician, and I was working for the uh, Holden dealer team at the time, uh, we were, were driving uh, VL Group A Commodores up onto these ramps. Wow. 
and we had to actually be hanging on the side of the building, pushing the car across so I didn't slide <laughs> off this over the edge of the truck. And I would think, how the hell do these guys drive these things? Because you can't see anything. It's just no. 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 You, you, they're braver than me, mate. I'll give you the big tip. Uh, don't take my head off to them. Ben, can you tell us a bit about your SVD business and the type of services you offer under that? Absolutely. Yeah, so John, um, SVD stands for our Specialised Vehicles Division. And as I referenced before, um, obviously pre-car will always be underpinned by that, that core OEM finished vehicle logistics service. Uh, but as part of our, div- our diversification and growth into the future, we've seen a, a very strong opportunity to set up the Specialised Vehicle Division business. And, and what that's all about is uh, offering fleet build-ups for a range of vehicles to support specific customer requirements. So to give you an example, um, customers in the utilities, government utilities or government infrastructure business have a fleet of light commercials or, or medium pickups that need fitting out with canopies or um, lights or they might need a GVM upgrade or a um, suspension kit. And we offer that service through our specialised vehicle division. And it's done directly in consultation with either an OEM, a fleet customer, a fleet management customer or an actual owner of the business. And it's designed to give that, as I say, that, that fleet fit up, a consistency of approach on a national basis if need be. It's not about one-off vehicles coming in and getting fitted with a, a bull bar or a, or a light kit. It's about building fleets of vehicles to support our customers in terms of getting those vehicles out onto the road. And it's a, a way for the, the OEMs to have that work done in one place at a, uh, you know, at a consistent price and by the same people. In the past, OEMs may have had dealers do that to the work. They may have contracted that to another um, part of the bid, to another supplier. Um, it allows us to provide finished vehicle logistics and then if need be, a bespoke fleet build up for our customers. Having said that, we don't just offer this to our customers of our um, OEM business. It's open to any vehicle. so. We've got a number of vehicles going through our specialised vehicle division at the moment for whom we don't do the OEM finished vehicle logistic business. So they've come through to us direct from the customer or a fleet management organisation. And they're staffed by um, a very high level of technically capable uh, mechanics, fitters, uh, who work again with our national technical department and our specialised vehicle division leadership to make sure that they're fitting vehicles up and building vehicles up in accordance with the customer requirements. The only thing we don't do, we don't offer like full-on engineering type services like we don't do wheelbase extensions or engineering, uh, but typically it's a, a range of services that I mentioned, things like canopy fitment, racking for commercial vehicles, um, lighting requirements, um, audio requirements, communication requirements. Um, we we do some mining vehicles, we put the fluoro decals on, we can wrap vehicles. So it's a, a further diversification of our core services but very bespoke in terms of we manage it on a customer-by-customer basis. And we work with a number of um, componentry suppliers, well-known componentry suppliers, to make sure that the parts that are going onto the vehicle are are the best quality and in consultation with the customer. So, Ben, this process, I've I've, I've used your services before and it's actually helped me uh, in in, in previous lives win business, which is good. So would it be fair to say that this uh, using the SVD, you've actually got some uh, quality assurance where you can have a standardised fit for sure. all the items versus getting independent dealers to do bits and pieces that you may get some variations. I think that's one of the biggest the biggest advantages, Mark, that we have that consistency approach that we've got the same people doing the same work on the same batch of vehicles um, as opposed to that individual sort of, you know, one person might work on a car one day, another a different day. And it's all part of being able to offer that full service to our customers in terms of We've got a national technical department who work with the customers to make sure all the requirements are comprehended. So that's a measure of how far we've come with the specialised vehicles division. So as far as it's a it's a solution for the end user, it actually is a solution for the OEM as well. Well, both. Yeah, that's right. And it's even a solution for the dealer in many ways because trying to coordinate a lot of these complex builds is actually quite a challenge. Correct. And all it takes is to get little bits of this wrong and you can lose a customer for life. And these customers buy large volume. So it's, it's a nice right. point of contact. Yeah, I agree, Mark. It's about scale. It's about consistency. It's about professionalism. And as you say, in, in a lot of cases, it's about further supporting our existing OEMs. Now, a question for me is uh, you talked before about 
COVID and uh, and just what you're starting to see now. But what was life like as business as usual before COVID? And then what's the impact of COVID that you're seeing? So if you're looking at a monthly run rate of X, yeah. what did you see yeah. when COVID hit? Yeah. And then what did you see, for example, the May, June, what you just mentioned? So there's a couple of, yeah, a couple of, um, I guess, stages there. When it all hit in March, business just stopped. Uh, the taps were turned off. We started to see through March and April, we fifty percent of our work just stopped. We, we just we didn't have cars going out. Our storage was starting to to increase slightly. Our customers were madly running around trying to cancel orders and stop arrivals and so on. But it, the flow of vehicles out of our compounds completely stopped. Then we got into the second half of March, uh, second half of May rather, um, when the government incentives were announced, and I think there was a little bit of uh, lockdown fatigue, Mark, to be honest, and the second half of May just went crazy. We saw interstate volumes increasing by getting close to 50%. Um, and that, that carried through into June. And to give you a, some perspective on that, our comfort level, if you will, around having a pool of vehicles to move interstate nationally is somewhere around 2,000 units. We saw that go up to 4,500 units as people came back into the market and wanted to buy cars, but a bit to our discussion earlier, you know, I want the red one that's in Melbourne, not the blue one that's in Brisbane. And I think the dealers for a lot of our customers quickly came to the realisation that the pipeline of stock was drying up. So they were grabbing any car that they could from a wholesale perspective to shore up their sales into the last part of May and into June because the manufacturers were just not ordering ordering vehicles. So we went from the business basically stalling in when it first hit for the first four or five weeks to going absolutely crazy from the second half of May onward. If you roll back from that March time frame, business as usual for us would have been between 25 and 30,000 cars arriving typically in an average month. We've seen that drop down now to about 10,000. Our storage levels were somewhere in the approaching the 50,000 unit mark. We've seen that drop down to about 25,000 units through the COVID impact. Um, and we've seen a number of opportunities that we were starting to investigate around future-proofing the business, um, so some initiatives around how we might be able to ride-share hubs, um, rental vehicle deliveries for our customers, some remarketing activities, how we were helping our customers approach that whole change in how people want to own and, and, and interact with vehicles. That, that whole discussion stalled. And I think that discussion will probably stall for a little bit longer as people still come the terms with, with COVID. So it was an immediate impact on the business. We had to act quickly to protect our staff in terms of health and safety. Um, we had to communicate quickly and constantly with our customers to say, look, we're still here. We'll still deliver vehicles. We're an essential service, but we saw a very significant impact on the business. And whilst June was crazy from a transport and delivery perspective, we're bracing for a pretty quiet July because we've seen that massive pull through June with the government incentives, pre-OEM price rises, people going, I'm not going to catch the train or the tram, I'm, I need to go and buy a small car to buzz around because I don't want to be on public transport. I think we've seen that all come into the market. A lot of people have come in and, and, and sourced a vehicle. Now I think with the industry stock levels in such a low level, and our arrival forecast really not growing until August, September, we're going to see continued impact of COVID for the next couple of months. Ben, you mentioned September, October. How would you predict the market going forward? Because Mark and I have had a lot of discussions about we think there's going to be a big shortage of used cars, there's going to be a big, big shortage of new cars. Yeah. What's your view on that? And when do you think it will start getting back to some sort of normality? Oh, I drove my crystal ball. It used to be all right, Mark, didn't it, some time ago? But <laughs> it's a bit cloudy now. Um, we, I guess we have the, the insight of being able to get forecasts from our customers around arrivals. And uh, I think really by the time we see arrivals getting anywhere near back to what they were COVID level, sort of that you know, 25,000 north, I can't see that happening until... October, November timeframe, John. And that will depend on, on the risk appetite, I think, for the OEMs to basically be going and placing production orders pretty well now. So they'd need to place those orders now to have those vehicles coming in before the end of the year. Um, and I, and then you, you, you run the balancing act of bringing too many cars in at the end of the year and having plate concerns and all that stuff as you go into the, to the end of the year. 
I can't see the market rebounding anytime soon to any pre-COVID type strength levels probably until into next year now. I, that would be my view. Again, based on the pipeline of arrivals we see through July, August, September. And I just don't know the propensity for people to be out spending significantly again on, you know, big new cars uh, through the remainder of the year. I think we will still see the OEMs take, well, not risk, but I think there'll be a, a continued level of confidence to water utes and larger SUVs that will let people tour around Australia and tow their caravan around Australia. So I think that part of the market will, will go quite strongly. I think there'll be appetite for the OEMs to order some of the more premium marks because I think that one of the reasons that we saw a strength in you know, the, the German brand and some of the premium marks through June was people with that fatigue lockdown who might have been planning to go overseas might have thought, I can't do that now, so I might treat myself to a new Mercedes or BMW or, or Audi or, or whatever the case may be. So I think there's some activity in that space. But I, I think the mainstream market, the mums and dads market, um, will be challenging for the remainder of the year. And that will all put pressure on used cars, I would imagine, um, going forward. That's just my uh, clouded crystal ball. We'll see how we go. Yeah, but it's not always easy, but I think you've got a pretty accurate forecast there. So it's going to be interesting to see the actual timeline of what, what pans out eventually. Yeah, yeah. So it's unprecedented times, that's for sure. Well, Ben, thanks for joining us and uh, really appreciated the what you've shared with us, read your business. Now, John, I'm just keen to, if I could put a summary together of, uh, of some of the key points that I took, and I'm keen to get your your take. And Ben, correct me if, if I've missed anything here or if I've misinterpreted any of it. So 30 years, that's pretty good. That's that's uh, a, a business that uh, is growing and, and has seen many cycles. If you think about 30 years ago was the last recession that we had. And then there was GFC in between all of that as well. I'm amazed with the curveballs that you've got to deal with. The curveballs of contamination, you've got hailstorms, you've got dust storms, all these things that you've got to still have these, you're an assembly line of car comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. You have no control at all over what happens on the boat. You've got no control over when the boats turn up. You've got no control over any contamination or all those other bits and pieces. So you've got your workforce that you're scheduled to have ready to go and all of a sudden a 1,000 cars can't go through the seats. I think that's a must. Uh, that must be, yeah. We've got a reasonably good grip on when the boats will arrive, generally based on the shipping info from the customers, barring any disasters, but the quarantine thing can catch us out. Correct. The quarantine curveball. Yeah. And then you've got the other curveball is that if they're all coming out of the wrong compound to go into state, you've got to get your rolling stock, your drivers, Correct. all of that geared up so that they're in the right states at the right time uh, and, and available to then go to the other place. And you've got the curveballs that I remember uh, in our previous life for GM trying to get trucks up the East Coast. Uh, when you've got flooding for your rental cars to try get them into cans for the holiday period there. So those curveballs and the interstate transport, and it's interesting, that's one of the, your biggest challenges still. And then you throw COVID in on the top of this. So you've got this draining of the comp, like initially stopping, and then all of a sudden draining your compounds out. You don't have the arrivals, but as we know, when you're, it's like drinking that nice old bottle of Shiraz. You get down to the bottom and there's a bit of sediment down the bottom there. So it's all those tricky cars that have been preserved for a while that you've got to get right. up and running and out. And you've got to probably go interstate as well. So Correct. you've got to deal with that sort of stuff on the back of planning what Q3 and 4 will look like. So, yeah, there's a huge expectation and in many ways, uh, cases, you guys – uh, the unsung heroes, if you like, of getting stuff done because it's just taken for granted that you just do it. I, I think there's, yeah, I think, like I said before, Mark, a lot of people say truck and go, oh, yeah, there's a new lot of cars going out to deal it, but what's had to happen to get the cars onto the truck is as we've talked about today. So um, I hope that I've given your listeners a, an insight into vehicle processing and finished vehicle logistics. It, it's a pretty uh, complicated, intricate, variable business. And on top of that, you've got your special vehicle division that can cater for very complex builds 
in large quantities for bespoke B2B and B2G customers. So that's even uh, even more complex that you're dealing with and you can, you're handling it quite well. And we're, oh, we're really excited about that. That's a, a big a big part of our, a big plank of our, our future growth, Mark, and it's um, we're proud of the fact that it's uh, pretty unique to Precar and um, we're you know, committed to making that, that grow. And, um, there's some other things that we know are coming from an automotive perspective in terms of some of the, you know, some of the car companies are looking to move to agency models. So we're going to start to see that, that potentially coming through going forward. And, you know, this whole demand economy, I might not want to own a car, but I might want to use a car. How can we be, be a part of that um, and support our customers in putting cars into that sort of environment as well? So let alone, you know, alternate propulsion and how we preserve those and all the technical requirements behind that. And you know, Alex and I went to a, uh, a seminar in Sydney last year at mobility as a service, and it was really interesting to understand how that sort of thinking will evolve around demand responsive services and how we can use some of our facilities or people or resources to support some of that as well. So it's going to be an interesting. I think the next sort of five, 10 years will be really quite defining in terms of auto and by default what we do. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff to come. A lot of stuff will go by the wayside. I'm still of the view that we'll probably continue to see the dealer footprint shrinking in its traditional setup. Um, and maybe we become a, a delivery service direct to customer. I mean, who knows? It, it, you know, I've been into the pop-up at High Point and I've signed up for a brand new white da -da 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 -da, and pre-car will deliver it on the 10th of da -da 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 -da. maybe that's where things go and and we stand ready to support that because uh, ben you know to me i've been a, having a good finance background i always look at the opportunities you know i saw three points that to me sort of really stood out from what you spoke about today the one is processing on wharf and the more cars you can process on wharf the amount you can reduce the cost so to me that would be one point as a OEM or distributor I'd really mm. focus on. Mm. The, se the second is that refurbishment of vehicles, the preservation. Yeah. If you can cut that down and get vehicles moved quick enough that you save on that cost. And the third thing is to get the optimization of getting the vehicles to the right location in the first place. Because if you get those three points right, I think you'll bring down your costs substantially. So to me, that was quite fascinating and something really interesting. And maybe there's some sort of tool to help the customer understand where he sits in all three of those parameters and how he plays in that space. I know it would bring your business down. But I was just going to say, you're helping the customer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at it from a customer point of view. So, Yeah, look, and obviously, John, we have many customers who do just exactly that and, and you know, procurement people and finance people who are always charged with doing that. And that's why we're so big on saying, well, we understand that, but we'd like to add some further value, be it through the, the specialised vehicles division or the or remarketing or um, helping you with electric or helping you with demand planning and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, there's a whole whole gamut of things that come our way and we, we just need to have that discussion To There's a midpoint, I think. Yeah, definitely. So. Well, thanks, Ben. Anything you want to add that we haven't covered off? No, look, I'd like, just like to thank... Thank you all for the opportunity again. Alex and I were quite excited to, to talk about pre-car and I, I, I don't know that we do enough of it internally and externally. So it's been great to share some of uh, the facets of our business with you all. So thank you. It's interesting, Ben, and thank you. Really, we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, go through those hard questions that we've uh, we put together for you. But, you know, for me, it's, I've been very close to the PDI process for many, many years and it's still to this day, it doesn't cease to amaze me how much you have to deal with and the expectations that car companies, and I've been guilty of it, have on the PDI, just get it done. But we expect it to be done with the highest possible quality yep. at the lowest possible cost now. in the shortest possible time. <laughs> so I'm guilty of that. I, did, I used to be the same on the other side. Yep. So even though if my organisation was guilty of providing you with a car that needed reworking or was contaminated and it was late because it was held up in manufacturing or transshipped yeah. correctly, because you're the last person to touch it, the expectation is you've got to get that. You've got to do it. <laughs> Dead right. <laughs> That's all good. It's yeah. actually been quite interesting coming from, from the other side and, you know, and, you know, my background there, Mark, I, I thought I'd... I knew this part of the business quite well, but when you, you come across and you're immersed in this every day, you just go, wow, this is such an eye-opener. And the, the work that 
Alex Milan has done the last couple of years is truly outstanding in terms of the changes he's made to this business and to future proof it. And I think we're starting to see the benefits of that now, but it's a monster. It, it's, you know, you, you'd say you work at pre with a thousand people and people go, really? It's it, the scope of this place and the opportunity to continue to grow is, is, is really quite exciting. And, um, but it's all like that. You're right. It's, no one waits for anyone anymore. It's this demand economy. Yeah, and just huge expectations. And it's funny if it was if, if you go back the other way when it was the manufacturer, you had your 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 the the supply chain logistics guy sitting in Adelaide. Cars would roll off the line. They'd go to the lot. They'd truck them out if they were allocated. If they weren't, they'd store them. That was easy. <laughs> by, by today's comparison, very very straightforward. <laughs> that was easy. And if there was a problem, it was reworked. Correct. Uh, the dealer, or they would rework something at, at the uh, at the plant. In the plant, yeah. No, those good days, but uh, long gone. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, as soon as you add supply chain and uh, international boot shipping and building, and just all the variables come into play, it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. I'll be as great as you after a while in this one, mate. <laughs> <laughs> ben, also from our side, thank you very much. No, oh, thank you, John. I really appreciate having someone of your caliber on the show. You know, there's so much happens in automotive that people just don't know about it. And that's part of sharing some of that. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure, mate. I, it's, it's, it, the industry keeps you in. I, when I left Holden, I thought about what do I do now, but I, I'm in a good spot because I'm back in it, but on a different side. And it's, uh, it's good. Keeps you ticking along. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching today. We've really enjoyed speaking to you. Some really interesting stuff came out of the discussion, understanding the back end of the automotive business. And I hope you got a lot out of that. If you like what you heard, please follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to us on YouTube. If there's any topics you'd like to hear from us, please leave comments either on our YouTube channel or also on LinkedIn. Or if there's any topics you'd like us to cover in more depth or talk directly to us, please feel free to contact either myself, John Sinclair, or my co-host, Mark Palavestra. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.